we've been kind of examining the emotional life of Jesus. And here in this passage, we see an occasion where Jesus is moved with compassion. It's a fairly familiar Bible story. It's called the feeding of 5,000 many times, but it's actually Jesus feeding way more than 5,000 people as we'll see in just a moment here. So if you wanna take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter six, verses 30 and following, that is where we will be this morning. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help. Father, we are thankful that we can taste and see that you are good. I pray you would give us again an evidence of that by speaking to your people from your word. Would you open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your law? Oh God, we need you. We need you. Show yourself strong and mighty in the next few minutes. In Christ's name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. The title of the message today is simply Exceeds Expectation. How many of you in your professional career have at times had to go through some sort of performance review or something like that? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, many people dread these meetings and then you go in and they give you some sort of a rating scale, one to four or one to five. And usually on the top of that scale is somebody who the, the terminology that many companies have adopted is that they exceed expectations. If you hit that mark, you generally are in for a pay raise. Amen? Amen. You often will have new opportunities put in front of you, sometimes even a promotion on the horizon. An employee that exceeds expectation is very valuable to the organization. Well, I bring that up today because even though you may not in your recent performance review gotten an exceed expectation, I will tell you one person that always exceeds expectation and that is Jesus Christ himself. And here in Mark chapter six, he does exactly that. He doesn't just do what people expect, he does way more than people expect. And here in the feeding of the 5,000, we are blown away by Christ's ability to not just do good, but to exceed our expectations. We read about Jesus in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where he's actually described in this way. Now to him who is able to do, what's it say? Above and beyond all that we ask or think. In other words, no matter how high your opinion of Jesus is, you're underestimating him. It is impossible to overestimate Christ because he exceeds all expectation. This is illustrated plainly in the feeding of the multitude here in Mark chapter six. Let me give you a little context. The story begins with Jesus' disciples returning from a ministry tour. So he has sent them out and they were serving around the area and countryside and they come back to Jesus. Mark chapter six, verse number 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. So the group's excited. They're thrilled at what God is doing in and through them. And they come back to Jesus and they are just jazzed, giving him a report of all the things that they have seen with their own eyes. But Jesus, knowing their need for rest, reasonably suggests, verse number 31, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they went away in a boat by themselves to a remote place place. So they're getting ready to go away, getting in the boat, probably crossing the Sea of Galilee, and the retreat plans are interrupted. Look at verse number 34. But many saw them leaving and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. I mean, can you imagine? The, the, these people were so eager and enthusiastic to hear from Jesus more that they hear that they're getting on the boat and they run around the sea and they beat him there. This must have been a slow boat, right? Just put yourself in that situation for just a moment. Jesus goes to Cozumel. And he's getting off the cruise ship. And the moment he sets foot on the deck, what happens? There's a crowd waiting for him to minister to them. Now, I just got back from vacation and uh, my family and I went up to Virginia. We did some museums and we visited my family and, uh, you know, we drove up there. So if I would have got up to Virginia and got to the hotel 
and put the van in park and got out of the car and there you all were <laughs> gathered around. I don't know that I would have responded like Jesus. I might have said something like, I love you. I am grateful for you all, but y'all got to go home. That's not what Jesus does in this passage. He gets off the boat, planning to go on his vacation, and the crowd follows him. They outrun him to the spot. And what does the Lord do? Verse number 34, key passage in, or key verse in this passage. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and had, what's it say, church? Compassion on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So in spite of the fact that Jesus had other plans, he saw the need of the people and he responds with compassion. And by the way, make no mistake, Jesus is not just a bleeding heart here. He, he doesn't just feel bad for them or empathize with their needs. Remember, he sees them as shepherdless and guess who he happens to be? The good shepherd himself. He's like, not only... Do I have sympathy or empathy for them? I have the ability to step in and give them what they need. They are sheep without the shepherd, and I am the best shepherd in the world. I can meet their need. Here's the reality, church, and it's a beautiful one. Jesus is both compassionate and competent. Jesus doesn't just feel bad for you when you are experiencing neediness in your life. Jesus has the ability to meet your needs. He's compassionate. He feels for you, but he's also competent because he's the good shepherd himself who is able to do for his sheep exactly what they need. This was true in Mark 6 and it remains true today, which leads me to my point this morning, which is simply this. We must believe that Jesus can meet our needs. You got needs this morning? Anybody needy in the house? Okay, if you're not, you're a liar. We all got needs, right? We've got needs in spades. And we need to all come to this place where we say we believe that the good shepherd can meet our needs in exactly the way that they need to be met. And I want to explore that idea for us in just a minute. Because remember, because Jesus is who he is, he's not able to only able to meet our needs, he's able to exceed our expectation. So I want to show you three ways, Lord willing, from this passage of Scripture that Jesus meets our needs beyond our expectations. You ready for this? Okay, first thing. Jesus meets needs, number one, at times we don't expect. As we already saw in the text, this large gathering was not on Jesus' schedule. He and his disciples were trying to get away for respite. And what is more, if you look at Mark chapter 6, it seems that Jesus is encountering some emotional stress as well. Well, where do I get that? Well, if you just back up a couple of verses, it appears that John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, friend, and probably the person who understood Jesus best in the world because God had anointed John the Baptist has recently been executed by Herod. So Jesus finds this out. His disciples are on this tour. He's tired and he gets ready to go on this trip. Look at Mark chapter six, verse number 12. Here's what it says. So disciples went out and preached that the people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So they're doing all these things and what happens? When Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded has been raised from the dead. So this is probably a recent thing that's going on. So Jesus is drained and he gets off this ship and he's bum rushed by a crowd. I mean, put yourself in that situation. Like Jesus is probably overwhelmed in many different ways, but he doesn't recoil. He doesn't see the people as an interruption. The very sight, the Bible says, of this shepherdless crowd moves the heart of the Savior. He looks at them and he has compassion on them. And the text tells us because they were sheep without a shepherd. This is good news. Because here is the implication of that reality. To Jesus, people are important, not an inconvenience. You ever feel like an inconvenience to God? I do. 
you ever come back to the Lord for the like 10,000th time because you've done the exact same thing over and over again? You're kind of like, shucks, Lord, here I am again. Do you ever have so many needs in your life? Relationships, finances, work, marriage, children, ad infinitum, sin. And you come to the Lord and you got to be like, man, you are sick of hearing this stuff, I'm sure. Like you are worn out. If people came to me this much, I would be like, go find some help somewhere else. Because you are bugging me. Here's the good news. You're not an inconvenience to Jesus. You're not a bother to him. You're not a burden to him. He welcomes you to him because to Jesus, people are important, not just an inconvenience. Do you ever feel like your drama and your mess? Anybody dramatic in the house today? Anybody sitting by you that should be raising their hand? Like, like let's nudge them, yeah. Do you know you're kind of like a lot? And do you feel that? The reality is Jesus welcomes you even if you are a drama queen or king. Don't exempt yourself there, men. Even if you are a mess, Jesus is not put out by you. Here's the good news, church. The compassion of Christ is constant. It just keeps coming. It's a well that doesn't run dry. Where do you get that? Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish for his mercies. What's it say? Never end. That's good news. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. That is a good word. Because my sins and my iniquities deserve the wrath of God and hell forever. But the Lord is compassionate and gracious and his mercies never end. This is the character of our Savior. With all your mess and your neediness, you may often feel like an interruption, intrusion, or inconvenience. But the reality is Jesus is never bothered by our burdens. Just bring them. He's never too busy. He doesn't grow weary. He can't be overwhelmed. He's never sleeping. He is full of compassion. And if he moved with mercy, listen, y'all, if he moved with mercy on a crowd that interrupted his vacation after his friend died, he can move towards you. Jesus meets our needs at times. You don't expect you're a never an inconvenience to your heavenly father. Come to him. Come to him. He welcomes you. He's not too busy. He's not overwhelmed. You are not inconvenient to him. Number two, Jesus meets needs not only at times we don't expect, but he meets needs in ways we don't expect. Look at verse number 34 again. When he went ashore, he saw the large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were sheep without a shepherd. Now look at this last phrase, super critical here. Then he began to teach them many things. This is significant because when Jesus sees the neediness of the crowd, his first impulse is to teach them many things. Now, Jesus isn't underestimating their physical need. We'll get to that in just a moment because he feeds them in a few moments. He's not ignoring that. But it seems to me that in the mind of the Savior, spiritual hunger is a greater need than physical hunger. Because he sees the shepherdless sheep and what does he do? Hey, let me teach you some things. In fact, let me teach you many things. This is so profound reality. We need to get this idea into our heart that spiritual food is more important even than physical food. 
This was an emphasis that Jesus made throughout his earthly ministry. Matthew chapter four, verse number four, Jesus says it very plainly. Man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Or John chapter four, verse number 34. My food, this is Jesus talking, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. Jesus taught the crowd because he recognized that their greatest need was to hear and obey the voice of God. Do you know that's your greatest need today? No matter what your situation or circumstance, our greatest need today remains what it was for the crowd in here, to hear and obey the voice of God. Sometimes we can look at our life and all of the messed up stuff going on, right? You got some messed up stuff? How many of you right now in your life have some sort of work or financial situation that you're dealing with that's a challenge? Raise your hand. Okay, good, good. Taking notes, they're writing that down in the balcony. Yeah. Just kidding. How many of you have some sort of relationship that is challenging in your life right now? Raise your hand. Very good. Okay, now, look, y'all, if you didn't raise your hand for that one, you need to meet some more people. <laughs> because people are the worst, okay, right? How many of you have, in your life or in the life of a loved one, a health situation that you're challenging with right now, right? We got problems. And we are tempted to think, because we have all these problems, that the greatest problem in our life is our circumstances, that we think, God, if this would just change, then things would be okay. If, God, you would fix what is out there, then my life would be fine. God, the problem is not really me. The problem is him or her or them or over there. The problem is somehow outside of us. The problem is our circumstances. But what is true in Mark 6 remains true today. Jesus sees the crowd, their sheep without a shepherd, and he has compassion on them. And what does he do? He opens the word. The greatest need of sheep is to hear the voice of the shepherd. That's what I need today. That's what you need today. You need to hear the voice of the shepherd. And here is the beautiful thing. Listen. The shepherd has spoken. You don't have to like say, I'm waiting on a word from God. We got it. Sometimes we call this the Bible and that's accurate and right. But oftentimes we also call it the word of what? Do you understand the amazingness of what we're saying there? This book is the revelation of the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And it tells us how to be in right relationship with said sustainer and creator of the universe. What is more, it tells us how we should live in this fallen, broken world in wise and godly ways. God has spoken and it is in this book and this is our greatest need. We are fools if we let this gather dust from Monday to Saturday. Your greatest need today, your greatest need tomorrow, the greatest need until the day we die is to hear from God and do his will. And God has said, in my grace, in my kindness, I have spoken. It's amazing in the Garden of Eden, you even go back to the very first days of creation. What does God do? He makes Adam and Eve, and then he talks to them. What does that tell us about the character of God? It tells us he's a speaking God. He, he reveals stuff to his people. And what does it tell us about humanity? That the only way that human beings are supposed to make sense out of the world in which they live is to hear from the one who made the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, you got needs? I, I know you do. Your greatest need, though, is to be a person of the book. Not of Facebook, but of the book. 
Because this can make you, according to the scriptures itself, wise unto salvation. I cannot promise that reading God's word consistently, being in God's word will change your circumstances or make your life easier. It may not. In fact, it may make your life harder at some times, but here's what I can guarantee, that God's word may not change your circumstances, but it will change you. It may not make life easy, but it will make you strong. And that is why Jesus, when he saw the crowds, like sheep without a shepherd, the first thing he does is he begins to teach them many things. He meets our needs in ways that we don't expect. We don't just need empathy. We need empathy, but we don't just need empathy. We need truth. We need God to speak to us and tell us the way that we should live. We don't need somebody just to say that's hard. That's good, it's helpful, but we also need people to share with us and here's what the Lord says about your circumstance to deliver you from it. Because empathy makes you feel better in the moment and that's good. But if we are to live a life that pleases God, we need to walk according to the voice of our good shepherd, following him, listening to his voice, hearing the way that he would have us to go in the future. But that's not the only kind of unexpected way that God meets this need in this passage. Look over in verse number 35 again. So disciples, they kind of see what's going on. The day's unfolding and they get a sense of what's happening. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, the place is deserted and it's already late. Send them away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat. So as the day wears on, I mean, the disciples, they helpfully suggest like, Lord, we don't have any food. And two, there's a bunch of people. And three, there ain't no stores here. What are we gonna do? Send them away. Jesus responds very shockingly. Look at the next verse. Look at what it says, super important. Look up at the screen. You give them something to eat. Now, if I'm Peter, James, and John, I'm like, wait, wait a minute, Lord. Did you not just hear what I said? I said, there's a bunch of people here. We don't have food for them. There's no stores around. And even if we had the money, which we don't, we couldn't feed them all. Jesus, are you listening to what we said? We don't have that cup of cash. That's a paraphrase. The RSB, Ryan Standard Bible version, whatever. And Jesus persists. Look, look, look at what it says. Verse number 38. How many loaves do you have? I mean, he just keeps pressing it back to them. You give them something to eat. How many do you have? And again, verse number 38. Then he instructs them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took five loaves and two fish and looking up at heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Now, obviously this is an amazing miracle. I know that's redundant amazing and miracle, like it's like, there's not unamazing miracles. That's the definition of a miracle, but I needed an adjective. But I don't wanna unpack the miracle right now. I wanna unpack the other thing that's going on there. Did you notice Jesus's emphasis on including the disciples in what he was doing? You give them something to eat. How many fishes and loaves do you have? You make them sit down. Here disciples, you take the bread and the fish and you distribute it. Let me ask you a question. Could Jesus have just um, fed them without the disciples? Yes or no? Yeah, I mean, he could have snapped his fingers, boom. Everybody's got food. He could have done, you know, I dream a genie style. Mm. And suddenly banquet tables everywhere. They're like, oh, how do we get here? Tablecloth. I mean, he could have done whatever he wanted, but he didn't. He didn't just feed them on his own. Instead, he chose by his grace to invite his disciples into the miracle of feeding the 5,000. 
What does this illustrate to us? Simply this, God often does his work through our hands. Jesus didn't need the disciples and he doesn't need you and I. And yet in his profound wisdom, he has chosen to meet needs rather unexpectedly through us. This is astounding to me. Look, does God need us to reach Avondale Estates and Decatur and Stone Mountain and Tucker? Does God need us? No, he doesn't need us. He could reach this community without us. Gospel Hope Church, by God's grace, or I'm trying to say the opposite. What I'm trying to say, I hope by God's grace, doesn't just like blow up with all of us in it. But if God did that, he wouldn't be like, dang, I don't know what to do now. He, he could do his work without us. And yet, in his wisdom, he has chosen to do his work through us. That's amazing. That's amazing that God would invite you and I into his work in the world of multiplying ministry through us. God could save your loved one without you, but he probably won't. He probably intends to do it through you. God could provide for Gospel Hope Church financially without you. But I'd sure like to be involved in what he's doing. So I want to participate in that because God takes the few loaves and the few fishes that we have in our hands and he is able to do more with them than we can expect or imagine. Remember, he exceeds expectations. God could disciple the next generation of disciple makers down in the hall at Gospel Hope Kids without you. He don't need you. But I'd sure like to get in on that action and be a disciple maker to help people take their next step because God works through his people. We need to recognize that sometimes God works in ways that we don't expect, and that means he invites us to be his hands and feet in the world. After all, one of the metaphors of the New Testament is that Christ calls us his body. In other words, he's the head, but the way that his head gets his work done is through the hand and the feet and the lungs and the appendix and the knees. We are the body of Christ in the world, the way that God gets his stuff done in the world. That's awesome. He didn't need the disciples, but he chose to use the disciples. You know, any golfers in the house this morning? Anybody golf? Okay, it's not like a sin. I'm just like asking, like anybody. Okay, we got, I'm like, no, I'm not going to say that. That's bad. Uh, ooh, no, I don't golf. Yeah. I didn't say like any kidnappers here today. Any kidnappers? No, golfers. All right. So when people are first learning to golf, oftentimes one of the biggest errors that they make is they take the club and they just try to swing hard because they're, they're kind of believing like it's up to me to get the ball down the course. So that, you know, rah. And what ends up happening when a person like swings really hard, well, one of two things, maybe they make poor contact and it kind of goes off here or dribbles off there or they completely miss and the ball goes nowhere. Well, here's the thing about golf is that clubs, golf clubs are designed for the specific purpose of projectiling golf balls down the, the course. You don't have to swing that hard. You just have to make contact with the ball and then let the club do what the club was intended to do. You don't have to lift it up in the air. The club lifts it up in the air. You don't have to make it go far or fast. The club does that work. I think that's a great metaphor for ministry in one sense. When we just take a nice swing and make contact with the ball, the club does the work. In many ways, if you will just step into the fray and do what God has called you to do, the Holy Spirit of God will punch that ball, that ministry ball, way further down the course than you could on your own. He's designed specifically for that. Now, I know I'm making a comparison between the Holy Spirit and a golf club, and I think that's probably blasphemous, but you get the idea. 
the work is not just in our hands. We can do more through the power of the Holy Spirit that is working through us. So we just need to step up and make contact with the ball. Here's the idea. Listen to this statement. It is when we do what we can that the Holy Spirit does what he can. It is when we do what we can that the Holy Spirit does what he can. Look, if you do not step up to the plate, if you do not take any swings, probably you're not going to be involved in what God is doing. That's just not his way. If the disciples would have said, no, we're just sitting on the sidelines. We'll set this one out. Jesus, you, you take care of it. Could Jesus have fed the 5,000? And yet they got to participate in that because they said, okay, Lord, whatever you say, like put the bread and fish in our hands. We will see it multiplied through us. Don't you want to be involved in what God is doing in the world? Don't you want to do more than you can do in and of your own power and in and of your own strength? That is the invitation here, that Jesus, through his grace and mercy, invites us to be involved in his great need meeting in the world. In the wisdom of God, he has chosen to get his work done through his people. This should fill us with both honor and hope. Number three, Jesus meets needs not only at times we don't expect, in ways we don't expect, but also to extents we don't expect. So the disciples bring a meager five loaves and two fishes to Jesus. And he feeds a crowd of most likely 15 to 20,000 people. The the text actually says 5,000 men were there. So there was probably women and children as well. So 15 to 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And notice Mark's commentary, verse number 42. Everyone ate and was, what's it say? Whoo. This wasn't hors d'oeuvres. Jesus didn't give him a snack. This wasn't goldfish. He fed them until they were satisfied. What is more, we read on Mark chapter 6, verse number 43, and they picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. It's a southern miracle because there's leftovers. Take home boxes. Jesus didn't just meet the need, he exceeded the need. He didn't just feed the multitude, he satisfied the multitude. He didn't just multiply the fish, he created 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Why? I think he's simply saying to the disciples, I got you. You guys are fretting about this, don't worry about it. Look, I can multiply stuff, just put it in my hands. The point is that when Jesus meets needs, he doesn't just meet them, he exceeds them. Sometimes we wrongly believe that Jesus is stingy or limited in his power. Think about a need in your life right now, and maybe you're like, yeah, I just, I'm not sure God can do anything about that. I I don't know. That person, I mean, they're just so hard. I, I don't. Yeah. Lord, help, I guess. And we unwittingly have had this view of God that he's stingy or reluctant or unwilling or unable to help us. But what the feeding of the 5,000 reminds us of this reality is that Jesus is the master of multiplication. He can do more. He can do more. I, 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 I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I look at my prayer life And the reality is this, my prayers are just terribly pedestrian. They're just, I'm just really not expecting God to do that much in my life, in our church, in our city, in our world. My prayers are pedestrian. And I would argue maybe even insulting to the Lord a little bit. Oh, that's all you're going to ask? All right, I can do that. It's not a big deal. I feel like the God of heaven sometimes is sitting up on his throne when we pray kind of on the edge of his seat and saying, I can do more. I can do more. Ask me to do more. Remember, I'm the God who is able to do above and beyond all that you think. I can do more. 
Can you think of areas in your life where you've just really played it safe even in your prayers? You just really haven't asked God to do much when he might be saying to you this morning, I can do more. You've got a need that advances the kingdom of God that is in keeping with the kingdom of God and his will and his plan, then I think we should lean into the throne of heaven and say, God, do more. Do more than I ask or think. Exceed my expectations. Sometimes we do ask things that are outside of God's will, that are not in keeping with his, uh, his truth and his word. Here's the reality. We need to trust the Lord enough to leave that in his hands. Rather than simply praying it safe in the way that we pray, we need to come before the Lord with an expectation that he can meet our needs to extents that we cannot even imagine. Maybe there are areas in your life where you are unwittingly believing that your need is simply too great. Let me take you back to where we started. Ephesians chapter three, verse number 20. Remind yourself of the character of God. Now to him who is able to do, what's it say? Above and beyond all that we ask or think. So what does it look like to believe that Jesus can meet your needs? Let me offer two suggestions here this morning. First thing is this, believe that Jesus can empower. I think that Jesus did this miracle every bit as much for the disciples as he did for the crowd, maybe more so. Because he wanted the disciples to see that he could work in and through them in profound ways. Maybe God has been calling you to something, but maybe you have been afraid. Maybe God is calling you to give more than you've ever given before. Maybe the Lord is calling you to share your faith with a coworker or invite your neighbor to church. Maybe God is calling you to get baptized or join the church or take a step of obedience that you haven't taken at this point yet. Maybe God is calling you to give yourself even to vocational ministry. I don't know what it is, but I want to encourage you all in this. God can empower you. He's able. You think this seems like a giant step? He's able to do it. He took five loaves and two fish and fed 20,000 people. He can meet you. Say, I don't have much to offer. Good. He doesn't need much. He doesn't need anything. He just needs your desire to be obedient to him. Lord, nothing in my hands I bring simply to your cross. I claim I ain't got nothing to bring to you. But here it is. And he says, that's enough because I'm not dependent on the strength of your hands. I am dependent on the strength of mine. And I got plenty of power. So will you believe this morning that Jesus can empower you to do things that maybe you thought you could never do before? Take a step of obedience. Grow in generosity. Grow in service. God, you can empower me to do that. Second thing, will you believe that Jesus can satisfy you? You know, at the end of the story, it says that he fed the crowd and they were all satisfied. I don't know the needs in your life, but the story reminds us that no matter what our needs are, Jesus is able to satisfy them. If you've made a mess of things and feel so far from the Lord, he is able to meet you and bring you home. If you feel overwhelmed by circumstances in life, Jesus is able to give you the strength to endure them. If you feel hopeless and without purpose, Jesus is able to give you joy if you trust in him as your good shepherd. Jesus is able to satisfy you in ways that nothing else can. Will you believe it? Some of you have doubted that. This morning, right now, you're doubting that Jesus can really satisfy. I want to encourage you to run to him right now. I'm going to ask our prayer team if they would move to the back right now. And I'm going to invite us in just a moment to respond. We're going to stand and sing together. And these folks in the back would love to minister to you. So if you're saying in your heart, man, I need to believe that Jesus can empower me to do what he's calling me to do. 
If you're saying in your heart, I've doubted that God can satisfy my needs. I've doubted that he can make me whole. I've doubted that he can forgive me. Man, these folks in the back would love to spend some time just praying with you and serving you. Would you respond in that way this morning? So we stand right now. I'm gonna pray for us. And when I'm done praying, the band's gonna lead us in a song. As they begin singing, you go. You go, you receive ministry from these people right here in the back, believing that Jesus can empower you and believing that Jesus can satisfy you. Father, we thank you so much for the work of Christ. Lord, that he is able to do more. I pray that we would put our faith and hope in him this morning. Lord, I don't know what the needs are this morning, but I do know that there are people out here with needs. I pray we would respond to you in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, I pray. All God's people said, amen. Band's gonna lead us right now. You go, you receive ministry in the back. You move right now.